Hey guys, welcome to Groups this week. If you're wondering who the strange ginger is, my name is Phil Harbison. I've got the privilege of being the venue pastor for our Saturday night service as well as our hashtag See You Monday service. So if you are regular on Sunday mornings, chances are good we haven't had a chance to connect yet. But either way, I'm Phil. Welcome to Groups Content. A quick recap of what we've been talking about. This sixth church in the seven letters to seven churches, and it deals all about the church in Philadelphia. No, not Northeast Pennsylvania. Philadelphia, the ancient city in Turkey. And really what's going on is that church that just feels the crushing weight of rejection and betrayal, both culturally, both spiritually, and even economically. We talked about how it was a great trade route and how the Roman emperor was just trying to just crush them economically because they were actually competing with the vineyards in Rome. But more importantly was this rejection that they felt at the synagogue, at the hands of the Jews, Christ went as far as to call them the synagogue of Satan, which is a horrible accusation. But again, it makes sense in context because they're facing that sense of persecution where they just felt like around every corner there was just a door slammed in their face. It didn't matter if it was cultural, political, spiritual, or economic. They felt that deep sense of rejection and betrayal. And so what was fascinating to me is that when Christ writes this letter to this church, you hear this great sense of comfort as he says, I hold the key of David. I alone am the one who can open and close doors. There is this sense of encouragement to a church that's barely hanging on. Right? And there's something so pivotal in this where we just sense that if he is the one that can open and close doors, that this has a huge impact on us because he's not just talking about synagogue doors, right? He's talking about the keys to heaven, the doors to the kingdom. He's talking about having the key to death and Hades itself. And so there's this sense of Christ, the way, the truth, the life, the gatekeeper, and the key holder, and the only one who's got control over all of this. And so I hope that as you unpack it, there is that sense of encouragement for you guys too as you just dive deep into what Christ was writing to this small, tiny, struggling church in Philadelphia. Kids, so glad you guys are back with us in groups So before we dive into some of the questions, I'm going to have you hit pause, and I want you to read in your Bibles Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Ready? Revelation 3, 7 through 8, go. So guys, Jesus in these verses is speaking to the church in Philadelphia and he knows that they do not have very much strength left. But yet they've still remained faithful even though they're just barely hanging on. So I want you guys to think, in your life, have you ever had a time where you felt like you were just barely hanging on, where you didn't have very much strength left? Can you think of a time like that? All right, guys, next I want us to read and hear the words of Jesus from Matthew 17. He said this, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So Jesus can use your strength even if it's small, even if it's the size of a mustard seed. Not only that, but he can use it in ways we can't possibly even imagine. So, three questions for us today, gang. Number one, how have you seen Jesus use your strength for something good? All 
our second question, has God ever given you guys the strength to do something you thought you couldn't do? What was that like when, he felt, when you felt like he gave you that strength? And guys, our third question is this. What is one way that you can stay strong in your faith? Can you think of one? All right, you guys, that's it for our kids group questions. And I hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day. Parents, you are up next. All right, groups, questions, adults, here we go. We're diving in. So I once got locked in a Mr. Taco. It is a very small restaurant chain in mid-Michigan. I want to know from you guys, have you ever been locked in somewhere? Or conversely, have you ever been locked out of somewhere? Discuss amongst yourselves. All right, groups, next I want you to read Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I know some of you may have already read it in personal devotions. I know some of you may have heard it taught this weekend uh, during services. But again, it's just so crucial that we dwell deep into the Word of God together. So go ahead, take some time to read that section of Scripture together with your group, and then we will continue this conversation. All right, so let's unpack this a little bit. As we've been diving deep into this passage, we've learned that the church, the Christians living in Philadelphia, would have sensed this acute betrayal at the hands of the Jews as they were kicked out of the synagogue. Literally, you can imagine that door to the synagogue being slammed in their face, and they didn't really know what to do next in that moment. So let me ask you this. When Jesus comes and he says, I hold the key to David, I alone can open and close doors, how do you think that would have sounded to them? How do you think that message would have been received by the Christians to hear that, that message of comfort, right? And have you ever had Jesus open or close doors where you just distinctly felt like, you know what, this is the path I'm supposed to walk and God has made it clear to me? Have you ever had a scenario like that? What was that like? So one of the byproducts of this rejection by the Jews in Philadelphia is that these Christians were second-guessing their place. They were second-guessing if they actually still belonged. Could they still have access to God the Father? When someone had told them time and time again that their beliefs were wrong, that their doctrine was wrong, that their theology was wrong, can you get this sense that they might be wondering if they still actually did have an open door to God the Father? Now, as we unpack it, have you ever gone through a time that caused you to second guess your place in the kingdom of God? Sometimes it, it's that sense of rejection of just feeling like you are too far gone. That maybe it was a sin that was so big that you committed that there's no way you can come back to Christ. You, no way you can come back to the church. Can you think of a scenario either for you personally or somebody you know that has felt like there's just no way they can come back to Christ? All right, groups, by now you've heard this phrase used over and over, eat this book. So this is, again, what we're going to do is give you a chance to hit pause, to really chew on things, and just to reread Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Go ahead and reread that together with your group. So as we continue to unpack this, there's that sense again that the Christians were enduring this, this sense of being told time and time again that they just had, like I mentioned, 
misguided beliefs, bad doctrine, bad theology, that they are heretics. Uh, a church word we use all the time is that they are apostate believers. They were full of that false doctrine. And, and can you think of a time in your own life, maybe when you were following Christ, but others around you claimed that you had the bad doctrine? And maybe it, it turned into something where they're like, yes, your Christian faith is outdated. Your Christian faith is antiquated. Your Christian faith is closed-minded, or it's just a crutch to help you get through life. Can you think of a time when you felt like maybe the world around you was looking down on your beliefs and saying that, you know what, at the end of the day, it's just not true? So there's a sense, too, in this passage that Christ is saying to the church, hold on, because what's going to happen is that all of these people who are throwing these accusations at you, when it, the dust settles, they're going to see that I have loved you. Christ is promising that they're going to understand that there is something divine going on, right? But there's this sense, too, that, that again, we kind of know this instinctively throughout the Scriptures, that every knee will bow when Christ returns, and there's this sense that he as the victor will come and just prove it. So when you think of that moment of Christ just proving once and for all that he loves his church, that he loves his people, that he's never going to leave them and never going to forsake them, what does that make you feel when you think about that moment when the sovereignty of Christ is on full display? Uh, so if you were able to be here this weekend for the teaching, I, I kind of relayed a story of a, a young man in my youth group, and, and I felt like he was determined to stay in this prison cell of self-loathing and condemnation and guilt and shame. And I, I just kept relaying to him that the prison door is wide open. You don't have to stay there. How insane is it to sit in a prison cell when the door is wide open? But I think a lot of us feel that sense of guilt and shame. We're like, we have to punish ourselves almost. And that self-forgiveness can be so hard. And I love this idea of forgiveness and freedom. And C.S. Lewis said it really well when he said, I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it's almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. So have you ever not let yourself be forgiven because you felt like you've had to sit in self-punishment and self-loathing. All right, groups, here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue this with uh, Eat This Book Part 2. If you've got time to continue on with us, awesome. Otherwise, you will see a time you can skip to. So the first thing I want you guys to do together is uh, read some of the following passage from this week's devotion, starting with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and go. So can you think of a time, and it might be a hypothetical, but can you think of a time when you believe that Christians will face persecution for their faith here in the United States? Or do you think we are already? So in your mind, how does this passage help you hold on to your faith even when you feel like the world is shutting you out? Next, I want you guys to read John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13.
So the church in Philadelphia is unique because this is the only one that didn't receive a rebuke or an admonishment or a correction from Jesus, right? It was the church that he took great delight in. But it was also one of the smallest churches as well. And when you think about this small church that's struggling to hang on and it has very little strength, there's this natural parallel to the boy in the story who also had very little to give. But yet, by trusting Christ, that very little effort was actually multiplied. So how do you feel like this relates to you? In what ways do you feel weak? Or conversely, in what ways do you feel like you have very little to offer Christ and the church? How do you feel like you can trust Jesus to make you strong? Or maybe another way to say that is, how do you feel like with what little strength you have or what little you have to offer that Christ can multiply or magnify that? So what is one or two practical ways that you can just trust God to take what little you have or to take what minimal strength you have left and to actually multiply it and use it for good? Is there a next step? Is there a prompting that you feel like this is the next move I need to make to be faithful and obedient in this process? So that is it, you guys, for groups, questions. Hope you guys have had a great time in groups. Hope you have a great rest of your day and a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here sometime at the Foundry. See you guys.